if I'm sitting at my desk here and I start thinking about squatting this evening, that's a practice of mental imagery. I'm just not doing it on purpose and I'm not doing it with any structure behind it. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Seek a Psych. This week we're talking about motivation during lockdown. The main text I'll be referencing today is called The Handbook on Motivational Counseling. It's written by Klinger and Cox in 2001. I think the version I'm working off is 2004's version. Right, so talking about motivation, brief description. As everyone knows, motivation is like a series of reasons someone will act in a certain way or have a certain behavior. What we're going to focus mainly on today is like motivation during lockdown and we're particularly talking about motivation to train or motivation to exercise. The real thing you have to look at here is motivation being a positive thing. So a lot of people might be motivated to have maladaptive coping strategies that might be alcohol intake it might be staying up late it might be taking part in like high stress activities all of these things are pretty maladaptive for athletes so we're going to talk about today like things that might help you become motivated to do some positive things for your sport or just for your exercise or to get in better shape so having good motivation or having good motivational strategies will allow us to obviously increase performance because if we're more motivated to train, we can have better training sessions, we can train more frequently. If we're more motivated to have positive dietary intakes and we're going to have overall better adherence. Right, so why is motivation important? We've heard a lot of people talk about kind of willpower being more important than motivation or just being super committed is more important than motivation. Realistically, willpower doesn't exist without motivation. Willpower is just a a constant view of where your motivations lie. So if I have very good willpower in terms of my exercise regime, I then just have a very good motivation to exercise or a very good motivational thoughts around exercise, which allow me to exercise more. So this kind of crap around uh, like, oh, you don't need motivation, you need willpower. That doesn't really exist. It just sounds flashy and it helps people to sell some books. Right, so what else can motivation help with? Another thing it really helps with is coping with difficulties. So you'll see people really having to focus on motivation during times of injury, uh, during times of when you're not able to train. And of course, this like COVID-19 pandemic when people don't have access to gyms or don't have access to your usual coaches. Us having really good motivational strategies will help us to train better, get in better shape, make sure we're not losing too much of the positive ground you might have made up when you were training. And they're the things we're going to focus on right now. There are a number of theories involved in motivation or theories people have come up with over the years as to what helps to motivate humans, what helps to motivate sports people. Achievement goal theory is the first of these theories we're going to talk about today. And to start off, I'm going to give you a quick example. So going to a weightlifting competition, you have Timmy, and then going to the same competition, you have Tom. Timmy is going to go to that competition, and he will feel good if he beats everybody else at the competition. So if he wins gold, he outperforms the competition. No matter what he lifts, he just wins gold. The other side of the example is Tom. So Tom goes to the competition. He's not worried about what other people do. He just wants to hit a personal best or he wants to hit a certain number in the snatch and a certain number in the clean and jerk. Both of these are examples of achievement goals. Achievement goals revolve mainly around people's perception of success. So how Timmy perceives success versus Tom is very, very different. And most of the research in achievement goal theory looks at two distinct paths. The first one is ego and the second one is task. So you'll hear us talk about like outcome goals versus process goals. And this is very much the same thing. The outcome goal here is that they need to win. The process goal is that Tom on this side has done something positive for himself. He has set numbers he wants to hit. And things that are outside of his control don't concern him. So he's going to be happy as long as he's performed well. The issue here is in the control. So the control or the autonomy, which is very, very important for motivation, lies outside of our grasp when we look at a an ego goal or a an outcome goal. What we need to do and what we need to do as athletes or as coaches is we need to ensure that when we're setting goals, if they are achievement goals, we want them to lie on Tom's side. So we want them to be a task-orientated goal or we want them to be in some way intrinsically motivated 
so that we have control over the things that happen at the competition. We have control over the levels of motivation. And then finally, we have control over how the athlete will feel following the competition. Obviously, some people are going to be really motivated by winning, right? Uh, I'm definitely one of those people. But if you're working with an athlete or if you're the athlete and you understand that you should be changing your thought process, you need to be looking towards those task oriented achievements. So maybe hitting certain numbers on the way to a one rep max. Maybe it's the amount of training sessions you hit per week. Maybe it's the amount of time you spend at the gym. For the case of somebody who's training at home during a lockdown, you need to be focusing on these tasks because you certainly don't have control over the outcome. You can't have control over the outcome because if we take a weightlifting or a CrossFit competition as the example, you don't even have control over if that competition is going to happen anymore. So look for your tasks, look for your processes in achieving those tasks, and then set certain goals along the way to achieving the kind of the general outcome or your long-term goal. To finish with the kind of achievement goal theory and ego versus task goals, Look, I understand it's not easy to change thought processes. Most of these things have been ingrained in us since we were very, very young. They're multifaceted. They happen in every area of our life. If we're competitive at running 5Ks, we're probably going to be competitive at playing Scrabble with our family at nighttime. What we need to start looking for here is rather than eliminating those outcome goals, we need to start looking at balancing them with task goals. So if the outcome goal is like, I want to be 20 kilos lighter and I want to have six pack abs. Then you need to say like, okay, that's the only thing that might make this athlete happy right now. Or that's the only thing that they think is going to make them happy. We need to look at those processes and look at the tasks they're going to achieve in between now and then and start giving them these smaller achievements along the way. This will keep them a lot more adherent. This will keep them a lot more motivated and it should keep them just trucking along even through those difficulties or through injuries. Attribution theory then is the next kind of theory that weighs in to the motivational research. When we talk about athletes, a quick example of how attribution theory might work is if you take the example of a soccer player playing a match. It's one all and my team gets a penalty given against them. So there's a foul in the box. People might attribute this to a player on the other team cheating a referee picking on you, uh, a member of the crowd shouting somebody and influencing a referee's decision. That attribution of blame or that attribution of outcomes is what attribution theory deals with. For somebody to be positively motivated, you want them to be attributing successes or attributing failures to things within their control. So rather than me blaming a referee or me blaming a player on the other team, I should be looking at myself and saying, okay, that penalty was given away because I didn't work hard enough on defense or I didn't train hard enough to be fit enough so other people on the team had to make up for my shortcomings. This again is an example of bringing things into our sphere of control. So gaining perceived control for an athlete, gaining perceived autonomy for an athlete is so valuable when it comes to motivation. When we look at the situation we're in now where a lot of athletes are training at home and how attribution theory might weigh in on this the classic thing we need to look at is okay the situation we're in now is unideal we haven't had control over any of this we haven't had control over gyms closing but what do we have control over so we have control over a lot of the time where we parcel up the sections of our day we have control over what time we go to sleep we have control to some extent over what time we get up we have control over our dietary intakes and we have control over what physical exercise or physical activity we do if i want to have a positive effect over an athlete during the covid19 lockdown you need to start giving them control over how they're going to be training so it's a very positive thing if somebody says okay i'm i've been locked out of the gym I've now taken a sandbag that weighs 20 kilos, I've altered my training, I've looked up these different movements, and this is the new program I'm doing. The exact same situation could be perceived so negatively if someone says, oh, I only have 20 kilos to train at home, oh, I can only do those movements, oh, I don't have access to the usual coaching or the usual equipment. So once again, it's the perception of the situation we're in 
it's where we attribute blame and where we attribute success is very, very important for looking at motivation. Self-efficacy then is the next thing. So self-efficacy relies on kind of six distinct things that will sum up to our total self-efficacy. The first one of these is past performance. As you know yourself, if you're somebody who's a veteran at doing certain tasks, a veteran at going to certain competitions, your past performances are something you're going to draw confidence from. They're something you'll draw motivation from. Similarly, if you were somebody who the last time you went to a certain competition, you had a pretty poor performance, your self-efficacy around that task could be quite low. Before we go any further, we should probably explain what self-efficacy is. Self-efficacy is your perceived effectiveness at carrying out a certain task and it's basically how good you feel about doing something if you have a fighter pilot they're going to have pretty high self-efficacy about flying planes the next thing then in self-efficacy is vicarious experience so if you have training partners who've gone and achieved certain things in the sport you will have higher levels of self-efficacy around achieving those certain goals if you know somebody in your family who might have played a certain sport before you will have higher levels of self-efficacy around achieving those things again the last four then are levels of verbal persuasion physiological state emotional state and imagined experience you can kind of see how all four of these mesh in and and uh, mix together so physiological state is obviously going to affect my emotional state if i feel drained and tired i won't have very high levels of self-efficacy the same way if i am emotionally drained i won't have high levels of self-efficacy verbal persuasion then is quite an interesting one right we've all seen uh, or you might have gone to like group training class you might have seen teams training together or you've been in a, a member of a squad and you're training in a gym and people are shouting and getting excited that can increase people's levels of self-efficacy, but it's probably not something you're going to get when you're training at home on your own in the shed. The last one then is imagined experience. And at this point, I think it's good to note that the reason I'm listing off all six of these is if you're looking for higher levels of motivation when you're training on your own or training in unideal circumstances, you should take this list of six things and you should look for where you are high and where you are low. So if I have... A really good group around me that's achieved many many things i i will probably have fairly high self-efficacy from the vicarious experiences i'm drawing on from them but if i know that i'm physically drained going into most training sessions every week i know my motivation is going to be quite low because my physiological state and more than likely my emotional state will be affected so if i'm looking for that self-efficacy side of things to try and help my motivation i'm gonna go for those low values and i'll see things i can do to improve them right so moving on to other kind of practical applications besides attacking those six points and seeing where i might have some low-hanging fruit fels et al came up with a a list or a process of improving self-efficacy the first thing on this list is modeling right so it's finding somebody in a similar situation or who was in a similar situation to yourself and trying to model either physical attributes or mental attributes that they may have so you're looking for a seasoned campaigner you're looking for a good model fit to you like we'll always tell people with their lifting technique try and find somebody of the similar body size and weight who's looking for the same outcomes that you do try and find them 10 years further down their training history and look at what they're doing and see can you emulate some of that we're looking for the same thing here in terms of self-efficacy so if i am a an underage rugby player and I'm looking for higher levels of self-efficacy, then I might look to a current professional or a current academy level player, and I'll start modeling myself off them. The second one then is relaxing performance standards or alteration of goals. And this is something like when working with athletes and when being an athlete myself, the last thing you ever want to talk about and the last thing you'll ever get an open ear to talking about is relaxing performance standards. I think the wording of this is a small bit off. I think you need to alter goals in a positive direction. So rather than saying, no, no, you, you don't need to talk about uh, running a 15 minute 5k, so you'll never reach that. You instead need to talk about, okay, what are the one kilometer times I need to hit? So can I run a three minute 1k? That's a goal. I'm going to set that as a goal. Before I do that, can I run a three minute and 25 second 1k? And I'll keep ticking off these goals. I'll really, really expand that list of goals I'm going to be hitting. 
And that then allows me not to relax the standards, but it's an alteration of standards and it's a simplification of standards that I'm not just going for this one piece at the end. I have this breadcrumb trail of standards and goals that I'm going to hit the whole way. The third thing then that Fels et al. talks about is reliving past experiences. It's the nature of the athlete's brain that we don't like to dwell on the positives too much. We tend to dwell on the negatives a lot. You'll see people who are very, very confident will always talk about previous experiences that went very, very well for them. But for most athletes who struggle with motivation, they'll tend to just dwell on the the negatives. So they might have won the competition, but they missed a certain attempt or they didn't hit a PB at the competition, even though they beat everyone else. The last two then are thinking confidently or acting confidently and efficacy through proxy or efficacy by proxy. These are two quite difficult things, right? Because telling someone to think or act confidently is very, very difficult. In a lot of intervention studies, uh, the results are a bit meh. But what we can do is if I'm the athlete and I understand that acting confidently makes me better, I will then attack that the same way I'll do with my training. So if I'm training at home and I know it's shitty to be doing 25 minute hit classes on a yoga mat in your hall or your kitchen and it might not bring about like a great confident posture or I mightn't feel good like I'll feel in the gym if I'm lifting heavy weights, but just bring a certain level of confidence to those movements no matter how ineffective or how shitty they are to do. Efficacy by proxy then is Similar to what we spoke about earlier, where we spoke about vicarious experience, efficacy through proxy is looking at similar performers in your weight class, in your competition, in your sport, or even not in your sport, and trying to see like, okay, this is what they were able to achieve, maybe I'm able to achieve something similar. So if you are a young rugby player who's always struggled to put on size and mass, or you're a young hammer thrower, you might start looking at, okay, other people who are really effective in their roles now, what did they do? What was their experience like when they were growing up? And draw motivation from that. Application then is next. And realistically, this is the most important part. We can talk about theories and science all day. uh, But if we can't apply them effectively, then none of that really matters. So if you're an athlete and you're training at home, or you're training alone now, and you're struggling for motivation, what are you going to do? I'm just going to propose a few things you can try. The four things are going to be goal setting. And I know we harp on about goal setting a lot, but it's so, so valuable. The next one is going to be some like cognitive restructuring, which sounds a lot more complicated than it is. We're then going to have a quick piece on mental imagery. And then the last piece is like an outreach piece. Okay, goal setting. What's important? Everyone's heard of like smart goal setting. So it has to be specific goals. They have to be measurable. They have to be achievable. They have to be realistic and they have to be timely. Uh, we've loads more videos and podcasts on goal setting. Other things that come up with goal setting, particularly goal setting when you want to increase somebody's motivation, making sure their task or process orientated goals are, that's so, so important. Making sure that there are multiple time frames included in your goal setting. So not that everything is in three months time or not that everything is in a week's time, but we have a nice spread out uh, spectrum or that kind of little bit breadcrumb trail we talked about earlier. Cognitive restructuring then is one, when people read cognitive restructuring in a a psychology text or a counseling text such as this, you're like, what the fuck is cognitive restructuring? Are you changing my brain? Are you shocking me? No, there's no electrodes involved, nothing like that. But what it's talking about is like, like this would be similar to like CBT, right? Cognitive behavioral therapies. Looking at certain thought processes, looking at certain processes of action and making links between those and how we feel. So when I talk about cognitive restructuring and you might be like an athlete who's reviewing how they did at a certain competition, cognitive restructuring there would be like, okay, usually when I talk about nationals, I'm like in a bad mood because of it, because I bombed out. I wasn't even opening at numbers. I thought I was going to hit, uh, all these different things and cognitive restructuring would be like making sure every time I'm talking about this now, it's going to be positive. If I'm talking about a process or if I'm talking about an outcome, I'm not going to talk about it unless it's in a positive light. So this will usually involve me discussing this with other people. It will usually involve me writing it into one of the training journals, but I'm not going to discuss it unless it's in a positive light. So this focus is on only focusing on things that are within my control only focusing on things that were relative to me or relevant to me. 
and you're gaining that autonomy you're gaining that control all the time as well as gaining the positive affect of this kind of cognitive restructuring this obviously is something that's not easy to do it's not something you're going to do after just watching a single youtube video or watching any amount of youtube videos but it is something to have in your mind that like okay this is important i need to kind of understand that derek keeps talking about like positive thought processes or positive self-talk so maybe this kind of cognitive restructuring is needed imagery then is the next one and imagery is quite important because people as a whole have this thing about mental imagery like oh it's for quacks it's for those mental race car drivers who are sitting in the pits imagining them driving around mental imagery is something everybody does you just don't realize you're doing it so like every time you think about going training that's a mental imagery practice if I'm sitting at my desk here and I start thinking about squatting this evening, that's a practice of mental imagery. I'm just not doing it on purpose and I'm not doing it with any structure behind it. If you're an athlete, so, and you're struggling for motivation at the moment, try using some mental imagery to help you gain that motivation we spoke about. So that mental imagery session might be a four minute piece around the imagery of me performing certain lifts. So I might be also gaining a certain skill because I'm using those mirror neurons, I'm doing all that stuff. We'll do a whole other video on mental imagery and how you might be able to start making your own mental imagery scripts. But when we're looking to gain motivation, let's keep it positive. Let's keep it quite short and concise and make sure it's proper mental imagery training, not just daydreaming at our desk. The final piece then will be what I call kind of outreach earlier or looking for that like efficacy through proxy or looking for that, that kind of vicarious motivation, that vicarious experience. We rag a lot on people looking at YouTube videos or needing YouTube videos to become motivated to train. And to be honest, I'm not going to change my opinion on that. Like, I don't think you need to watch somebody doing like a hundred mile run with some motivational music behind them in order to be able to go and train effectively and certainly not to have continued motivation to train over a prolonged period. But what can be very valuable and particularly for developing athletes is if we look for other people who are going through the same thing now or if we look for other people who have gone through the same thing previously. A good example of this would be find somebody within your sport or find somebody within your within your kind of sphere so if it's like strength sport if you're a power lifter you might not necessarily need a power lifter but a weightlifter or a strong man would be a good person to look at so find somebody with similar kind of parameters to you who's in a similar situation to you and then start looking for okay what did they do they achieve this maybe i'll be able to achieve this uh this was certain process goals they look for like there's more content online now than ever before ideally of course you'd be looking for somebody to be able to reach out to in person and have this kind of shared experience with but even if it's like an instagram dm those can be very very valuable right i hope you like today's piece on motivation we didn't go too much into theory or at least i hope not anyway if you could hit that like button subscribe comment algorithm or comment whatever you want really uh, that'd be great for coaching and consultancy go to seekstrength.com and if you want to listen to the podcast go to spotify itunes all the usual places